Okay, I have a question for you. If you were to choose whether you would learn to earn a living or learn to live, which one would you go for? If you were, if you were to choose between earning a living or learning how to live, which one do you go for? The number one gives you a safety and kind of job and kind of, it looks like about physical needs. But the second one, when you think about it thoroughly, is actually why we live and why we learn or to earn the living. Because of the art, that's why we live. Art is everywhere around us. When you look just around this room, you heard the music. You've seen this art here. You are watching this art here. You've looked at the culinary art. But literally, art is everywhere around us. In the paintings that are so different and so unique, yet we can appreciate all of them. We can, express, we can enjoy the Monet, which is the up top corner, which is kind of very hinting and not precise, and we can ex ex really appreciate cubism of Picasso, or very different way of painting in uh, Salvador Dali. We can enjoy all different types of music. Is your type of music on the board? I might miss something. Of course, I missed many different types of music. We have different sculptures from sand ones, from ancient ones, to some kind of very, very contemporary ones that we perhaps don't understand, but still appreciate them. And then you walk in the nature. And then you walk into the real artist studio of our God, where you can see everything from the wood, woods and forest to the v v waters and to the animals, from the birds uh, to absolutely everything that you find in the nature speaks about huge variety and huge artwork uh, that it's, I would like to argue, impossible to explain just by random processes, just by unguiding things. I, I, I am a very strong, upon a, a very strong um, advocate, and I believe this is so evident when you study the evidences of science, that the art in the nature is designed and it's put forward to it. Even this art, as creepy as it can be, and some of you are fainting already, this is still a wonderful piece of art that, that is, you can't reproduce this. You can't make this and say, have a go. From the small to absolutely big, everything from the hidden to known creatures, there is art. Art is everywhere. And for this we live. I have some pictures of uh, trees. This is what I'm amazed of if you ever got the chance to study shapes of leaves and shapes of the trees, of the barks, how they, they work. And of course, we can go now into flowers and everything else. But this is not a sermon about this. This is a sermon about and topic about why is God such a great artist? Why God being an artist means a lot to us? And why can we really be happy and blessed that he is so? Number one reason why so is because God takes us from this functioning to the flourishing. I asked you earlier a question, which one would you rather learn how to earn a living or learn to live? Did you, did you have any idea? Share with somebody next to you, which one would you pick? Number one, how to earn a living or how to learn to really live? Share with somebody next to you, which one would you go for? Well, art is about this something special. While Maslow has this hierarchy of needs, and while earning to a living is a great and necessary, it only kind of covers the first two very basic needs that we have, physiological and safety. It gets us to sleep, gets us food, and it gets us home, and gets us extra money so we don't feel like we need to beg all the time. And kind of this is a necessary need. You can't talk about art unless these basic needs are met. That's why in the past, the artists were rich people for most of the time. 
because they had a little bit extra money, extra time to involve with themselves in the art. But everywhere people have the need to go over this basic functioning survivalism stage into something bigger, into, into love and belonging, which is art by itself, how to have a love go, romantic love for the period of your marriage. This is so wonderful. Or esteem or self actualization. These are the type of the levels of our existence that God wants to touch and tell you this is where you need to go towards as well. Don't just be happy with the ordinary, with the, with, with the survival, with the normal things. We have stuff like this. This is art. We are building houses right now and we kind of look at a lot of uh, houses, display houses and some of these are absolutely beautiful. I want you to compare first few pictures with something that is coming. If you like this, when I change the photo, just say, I, I'm gonna buy this. Nobody likes this one. <laughs> I, I'm gonna buy this one, they or not. But this is, this is art. It's, they have thought about, something appeals to us about this, this, this picture. There is not just basic and functioning. This is very simple uh, way of arrangement of the house. But there is still something appealing to it. Uh, colors are not vibrant. So in the case you mistake art for just vibrancy of colors, you know, there is a bad art which is not art at all. And we all can tell apart what's art, what is not. Or this one, there is something appealing to these pictures and the colors and that they have selected and tones and everything else. Now, you could get a house like this and it would be functional. You would still be able to cook your lunch and sleep and have a roof over the top. But what's the difference? What's the difference apart from the price <laughs> between the first and the second? Because this is what you could live in and many people do and I live in probably one of those right now. But there is something in us that says this is just basic functioning operating system. This is what I need to live in. And then you don't need more than that to live. You don't need more than that to be happy. You don't need more than that to be satisfied in life. But on all of us, there is this artist that is saying, I would love something to be appealing to my aesthetic needs, to my aesthetic uh, preferences. And this is something that science can't quite touch. It can't really describe this going from the really aesthetically appealing things to just, just the basic ones. I mean, this type of stuff is everywhere. Oh, just in the case you think that, that the, small house, the only small houses are bad. This is a big house in Russia that, of course, you could get as well. These kind of types are everywhere. Uh, people can sing, right? And I can sing. Did you guys hear me sing? Did you hear me sing? Well, I can sing. Um, uh, Jesus loves me, yes I know, for the Bible tells me so. Are you guys amazed? <laughs> I, hit, I hit every note precisely where it should be. But was it nice? Not really. I mean, I, I know how to sing, I, I can function, but is it art? I don't think it is. Uh, when you come to piano, you have two types of players of piano. You have type of player who would sing like this. Would you go to concert for this song? I have a friend with me, Haynes. Give, me, give Haynes a big clap. You can sing and nobody will want to listen to you. This is survival. I can sing for survival. I love belting out song. Every time you know, I see Lauren sing and he sings beautifully, I think, yes, if I just yell loudly, I would sound like him. Um, but there is difference in how we actually sound. A very subtle difference that we can't actually put our hands over it. And I'm really not sure where the difference is, but there is one.
difference between my singing and his singing. One is functionality. I can survive with this. If somebody tells me, sing the song, or I'm going to shoot you, I will sing it. But when Hans sings, something different. Can we go to, ah, oh, it's here, excellent. So, this is what is God guiding us, I believe, personally, from. From just mere survival into art. Art, by definition, wow, this is a bad picture. This is an artful picture. <laughs> It's very interesting how Bible describes how what art is. Bible, uh, sorry, definition of art is this: that it's um, the quality, production, expression, or realm according to aesthetic principles of what is beautiful, appealing, or of more ordinary significance, of more than ordinary significance. Not these things. It takes us away from just the ordinary art into more than ordinary significance. Now, Lee could have made this to look you know, like I would have done, just kind of a tube. But he has formed it. Do you like this thing? We're selling it afterwards on eBay. <laughs> no. But he has formed it, so he has appealed to it. You could argue, why is it appealing to it? But there is this little bit extra that there is this. In the materialistic world that we have, Today, and I will really need the PowerPoint to, to, to go faster to this. Uh, the art is despised because we are just trying to get to the bottom of our existence. We are just in a different culture. We are trying to get to the money and to the living and to occupy ourselves with achievements or with the money, with stuff that is kind of necessary. We are in the culture that is uh, instantaneous. 
well, art is taking a time to be arrived at. We are in the, living in a culture that is shallow, while this is a depth of the soul that comes outside. Today's culture is more going to towards description. Kind of everything has to be exactly described and prescribed and, and tested in the tubes, and so everything fits the, the line, while the art is more experiential. You don't go in the art with your head. You go into the art with your what? Heart, and you have to feel it. If you don't feel it, you can talk about it, you can write a book about it, but you have not experienced it. You have not gone away from the ordinary and somewhere else. So the art is living in a perfection, or at least this is this, what is called Zenzucht towards perfection. Now I use this German word Zenzucht because this is a philosophical term as well. Uh, and it's hard to describe it completely right in English language. But a philosopher has tried and comes close to nostalgic desire or nostalgic longing for something big. When Germans say they have Zenzucht, this is not just desire, this is more. This is like emotional pain to, towards something. And this is what art is getting us in, towards. Art is getting us to think about this emotional longing for perfection. And the only place perfection comes from is God. And this is not perfection of behaving like we are talking about. You have to be obedient to the law. But we're talking about art going away from the ordinary into perfection of our being, into the totality of our beings. When this happens, when we let God guide us there, then we realize that there is God hiding in this. God is set there and God is hiding in there in the true beauty of the world. And to this Zenzuch towards the perfect world, perfect expression towards higher stages of existence, not just physiological and safety, but towards belonging, esteem, and self-actualization, we really become and come closer to God because God is pulling us. Why is he doing this? Because we, he knows if we stay just at the bottom of our needs, just in survival mode all the time, we will never look up and ask, what can be better than this? What has my father originally created for? We will just get satisfied with living in the mud and never go anywhere else. It's a slavery that today's world is trying to keep you in. Our God, the artist, is trying to pull you away from this and say, you can do so much better. You are so much better. That's why he gives you Sabbath day. So you don't have to be a slave to the work and to your safety and physiological needs. But, but you can go and think about who you are and who you could be and who your fellow work, uh, people are. That's why he gives, you, gives us the, the whole range of, 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 uh, of things that we can actually go towards. The third point I'd like to, to go move why God is an artist, and this comes so wonderful when you get a little bit engaged into philosophy and, and philosophy particularly of evolution. Because evolution, while well, one way is science, the second is a huge science fiction. And uh, really it's become philosophical system rather than science. See, philosophy is talking, teaching about naturalism. In naturalism, nothing can be, Denise, can you go and help them over there with my computer? I really need it. It's the starting itself. <laughs> Perfect. I mean, this is something I was praying for. Lord, can I make up to just die in the middle of the presentation? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, Denise, when you get there, the password which will ask you for password is Mushki with capital M and then 07. Otherwise, you won't start it. Okay, everybody knows my password now. <laughs> we may not even use it. But I'd like to talk to you just about this thing. The problem, the problem with, with explaining art from an evolutionistic point of view is that it doesn't serve a purpose. Everything tied with the theory of evolution that what we have developed, our brain, our walking, our breathing, our eyes, our ears, and so on, has to do with the better survival and better social skills. Apart from it comes to the art. Art doesn't actually serve any particular purpose. Uh, some would probably argue that it does, but let me read you some of the quotes. 
And there are a couple of things that people are forgetting. One is what we have as human beings is this subjective and then there is objective art. Subjective is just very idea that I can appreciate art. There is a lack of definition from evolutionary point of view to, to see this. Why would I appreciate Picasso, for instance? Did you know about the story of Picasso uh, in, back in 1950 when Picasso was alive? A journalist, or actually I think it was a, like a rock star or something, came to him. There was this big event and he told him, hey, are you really Picasso, Pablo Picasso? He says, yes, I am. He said, really prove it. Paint something. And he painted something. And the guy looked at it and said, yeah, right, and threw it on the floor and walked away. This little drawing right now is now worth thousands of dollars because this really was Picasso. But this guy could not judge the artist just by you know, moves and lines that he has done because art goes way over it and it's subjective. But our ability to appreciate the art is not explained by evolution. It can only be explained by something else. That we are not just products of our neurons and nerves in the brain, but that there is something inside us that makes us appreciate. The second is objective art that is also not being uh, explained by any, uh, uh, any kind of scientific ways because science has, there is a reason why science can't touch it. And I'll read you just a quote. But for instance, think about sunset. Do you like sunset? Put your arm up if you like watching sunset. Why do you like it? Can you explain this? I can tell you why. Because it's appealing to you. But why is it appealing to you? Colors coordination. You can take the same colors, put them in front of you, it will look completely different. It doesn't help your survival in any way. It doesn't help your skills in any way. But you will find it beautiful each single time. You will find just fantastic. <laughs> hey, uh, I hope you can ex ex skip through these things and just go to the. So just wait until the PowerPoint starts, and then we'll see if we can start. If not, I'll just finish in a few minutes anyway. So I, I won't bother about this. Let me just re read you a couple of quotes about this. Bernard Russell says this, and this is he talking about naturalism and scientism. He says this: whatever knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods. And what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. Did you follow this? Let me read you once more. So Bertrand Russell is this uh, atheist scientist, brilliant mind, who believes that only way for us to have any information, any accurate information, is through science. And so he says this again, whatever knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods. And what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. It is true. It is true that we cannot know stuff that is not attainable through scientific knowledge. Well, John Lennox comes forward and he says this. If this worldview was true, it would at once spell the end of many disciplines in schools and universities. For the evolution of philosophy, for the evaluation of philosophy, literature, art, music, lies outside the scope of science, strictly so-called. How could science tell us whether a poem is a bad poem or a work of genius? Scarcely by measuring the lengths of the words or the frequencies of the letters occurring in them. Who of you is loving with poetry? Who of you has written some poetry? I have a bunch of poetry. It's in Croatian. I can lend it to you afterwards. But there is something about poetry that when you read, it's not about combination of the words. Something touches you and draws you in it, and you absolutely love it. How could science possibly tell us whether a painting is a masterpiece or a confused smudge of colors? Certainly not by making a chemical analysis of the paint and the canvas. The teaching of morality likewise lies outside science. Science can tell you that if you add strychnine to someone's drink, it will kill them. But science cannot tell you whether it is morally right or wrong to put strychnine into your grandmother's tea so that you can get your hands on her property. And it seems to me that science, that God has put art here as a recognition, 
and saying, guys, science can take everything away. He can demoralize you, put doubts in your head and everything else, but he cannot touch art, the higher level of living. This is something where you can only account God for. Is art there in the Bible? Point number four, absolutely. It's absolutely everywhere. From Unfortunately, we as a church have suffered for, the, for a while because there was this dualism. You probably know that you know, matter is sinful and our soul is holy. And therefore, we should just try to survive and look after our body instead of outside the world and, and, and the art. And so we have suffered a little bit. But it's absolutely everything, everywhere. It's in worship in heaven. You re, when you read the Revelation, there are angels who sing hymns. And there is, a, there, there is this song continually happening. Why are they singing? Why are they not just saying words? Because singing is, again, art. Art of speaking. It's, it's a, it speaks to us. It touches us. It works every time we work on this. Uh, music is the Bible prescribed as a necessity. Read Psalms and say this is almost like a command. Use the instruments and the drums and the harps and the flutes and everything. Even the guitars if you have to, the Bible says. <laughs> but there is music everywhere in the Bible. Then, then we come to sanctuary. Remember the tabernacle? God says, I'm going to live among you. And it, it is a movable thing. But everything in it, it's is skillfully made. Bible talks about this, and, and you read this, how they were acquiring people with skills to master all this. Then you have creation art. God, Bible says, has created everything beautiful in its time. Ecclesiastes says, um, Isaiah says, lift up your eyes and look into the heavens. Who created all this? He who brings out the starry host and so on, saying God has been involved in creation of the world. And when he's done creating the world, it wasn't common. It wasn't just basic. It wasn't just all right. It was not only good. It was all very good. It was all to the perfection. It appealed to us in functionality and in our aesthetic sense. And of course, then there is Jesus. Remember how Jesus was talking? What, what do we call those stories he used to tell? Why did he use parables? Why he didn't say, people, I told you once, told you a million times, listen to the God. Otherwise you go to the hell. But he comes and he sits and tells a story. Stories after story. What's a story? Is it just a normal language? When you want to tell you to your wife, when you talk to your wife or you, wives, when you want to tell your, your, your husbands to, you know, dish, wash dishes, do you go and tell them the stories or what do you say? <laughs> you probably use imperative. <laughs> you know, you do it or else. <laughs> but Jesus doesn't do that. He uses art of speaking and he covers the whole truth in such an artistic vehicle that would reach the audience. The whole art is there for us to experience God, people. For us to experience the fullness of life. For us to experience the fullness of our self-actualization. And this is why he's doing this. And then there is recreation in the Bible. When the Bible talks about the new city, new Jerusalem, that comes, it doesn't say it's going to be huge, everybody's going to be safe, nobody will be attacking you anymore, you'll have enough food, you'll have enough water, It'll be warm. Don't worry about anything. But the Bible goes to describe this city. And you know how it describes it? It was made of jasper. I know, Dennis, we are building houses. Do we use any jasper in our house? <laughs> Anybody here using jasper in your house? It's a bit expensive. <laughs> I inquired. Jasper walls are, you know, very, not so functional. And not so much, very, very expensive. And then the foundations of the city were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, then comes sapphire, then chalcedony, then emerald, then sardonyx, carnelian, and so on and so on. Gates were made of pearls. The streets of the city was pure gold. What is this? Is it an art in making? God is not calling you to the city which is to have a basic accommodation. It's calling, you're not calling to, you know, some 
five stars hotel. This is way beyond the stars, way beyond everything. A couple of more things and I'll finish. One is God is big for art, but art for meaning. God gives you and me meaning. When you talk to scientists, evolutionary scientists, they can tell you how we can come, they can have a theory of how we came, how everything functions, how everything is running around, but that they can't tell you why. They can tell you how you can live longer, but they can't tell you if you should live longer. They can tell you how to live your life, but they can't tell you why you exist and why you should love your life. The meaning comes only from God. And God has this wonderful art of meaning. Uh, he has a story unique for each one of you. Bible says, where Apostle Paul talks about himself, he says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. I only, if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. This guy had a harsh life, but he had meaning, full of satisfied life, meaning life. Do you want this? What do you want your life to be full of? Full of empty moments, ordinary, or something extraordinary? Because I don't know any of my personal heroes who had ordinary life. James Bond. I've never seen a movie James Bond sitting at home playing video games. Boring to watch, you know. I've never seen, you know, Frodo and Sam going, so let's, let's make some sandwiches. And the whole show is about making sandwiches. No, these guys go up the mountain. They, they will get to this. They will drop the drink. They will defeat the devil. Wolverine. This guy doesn't spend home, you know, making, doing the makeup for three hours. This guy has a mission. He has a meaningful life. He's going to stop the evil no matter what. Luke Skywalker. <sighs> this guy doesn't hide somewhere to be safe, far away from any trouble, far away from the dark waiter or dark people. This guy takes his saber and he is going to find some trouble because he is on a mission. He will not stay home. What about your life? How much is your life about this basic physiological needs and the safety and how much is your life about God's work which is the art which is the mission which is the life the meaning where are you in this are you listening to your God of who is artist who wants you to lift your existence up from this basic existence worrying about bread and life worrying about your hair or makeup or whatever to something much higher and say trust me who of you will be Frodo, James Bond, Luke Skywalker, Paul, Gideon, Moses, Jesus? And I would love to finish with two. Last is art of saving. Art of saving, art of loving. God is full of this art of loving where he loves the world more than anything else. But I will finish on this. You, Bible says that God, art, work, is you. It says that you are uniquely formed. You are uniquely called. You are not called to be a copy of the world. You're not called to be just a replicating, self-replicating mechanism of the culture, but you are called to be somebody different. John Piper writes this, the world wants to enslave you, to make you a puppet of their idolatry, to steal from you your originality, your Picasso, your Monet, your Salvador Dali, your creativity, your purposefulness that only God wants to give you. You don't need to be a copy. You don't need to be like everyone else. You don't need to be an average consumer and statistical user, a conformist to the culture, a fan of intoxicating freedom without any holiness or meaning. The world does not need more cool, more hip, culturally savvy, irrelevant copies of itself. There is a hoax that has duped thousands of Christians. They think they have to be hip and cool and savvy and culturally aware, watching everything in order not to be freakish, not to be singled out, not to stand alone. But perhaps you need to stand alone. 
Perhaps you need to be a unique artwork, a sad song, or a happy song, or a dancing hit, or a misunderstood as Picasso, as extravagant as Dali, or as hinting as Monet. But God is an artist and He's at work and He wants your life to be unique. He has a mission for you. Do you feel it? Would you speak to Him? As we listen to the last song, would you let Him mold you, craft you, bend over you, extract the best out of you and make you to something beautiful, something of a worship for His glory?